So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do here. Functional programming has been around for a very, very long time. Well, this has been around for so long, but we're just about getting excited about it. Almost every mainstream language we can think of is beginning to support this style of programming. Well, we can program in functional style. We can learn that. But I want to touch upon a few design concerns. What, what could those be, and how do we approach it? So I want to spend the hour talking about a little bit about functional programming. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, what are some of the concerns. Um, this talk really came out of two things. This talk came out of um, me teaching courses in the industry. When I teach this to the developers, they often ask a few questions. I kind of collected those questions that normally developers ask. And I said to myself, if these developers have this question, chances are everybody else who's going to be doing this is going to have it. So I kind of turned those questions into a talk. The, the other thing is, uh, sometimes, sometimes things are not that obvious. Things are not that uh, clear. And we tend to really you know, think about, is this really practical? Is this really useful? Is this something we could actually benefit from? And, and so I want to touch on some of those, those ideas uh, in this session. So let's get started. Well, the very first thing is, a lot of us, most of us, probably have programmed an imperative style of programming. In the imperative style of programming, you, you, you show what to do, but you also show how to do it. So you spend a lot of time and effort writing the code that does, uh, you know, if, with the details of how to execute a certain logic. In a declarative style of programming, you spend your effort telling what to do, and you let the underlying libraries figure out how to actually do it. So you end up writing a lot less, but you make use of quite a bit of code that already exists under the hood. And of course, in this particular declarative style, the code is a lot more expressive. So moving from that, we are then saying we're going to program in functional style. So there's like three styles in front of us. There's the imperative, there's declarative, and then the functional. Well, functional style is declarative. So it's kind of like a subset of it if you want to think about it this way. But in the case of functional style, you use declarative style. You say what to do and not how to do it. But you also include what are called higher order functions. But I want to touch on a few key principles of functional programming and then lead that towards you know, how effectively can we follow that. This is especially true for two reasons. We have spent decades writing code which is not in functional style. Now, if I ask you to go learn a syntax, you will probably come back in a short amount of time and say, got it. If I ask you to go learn a library, you would probably come back in a few days and say, got it. Because learning a library, learning a syntax, is something we are very used to. You have done this several times already, whether you realize it or not. But learning to think differently is very difficult. And, and learning to think differently, we normally call it as a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts are hard. To change a paradigm, you have to force your mind to think differently. And paradigm shifts often take a lot more effort and, and time than just learning a syntax or learning a library. This is one of the reasons why all the previous versions of Java took a lot less effort to learn compared to Java 8. Because Java 8 just did not introduce new syntax, because previous versions did too. But what Java 8 did was it modified the paradigm on us. And when the paradigm shifts, it takes a lot more effort to understand that. So in that regard, let's talk about functional programming. So I, I mentioned that in the imperative style, so just to jot down a few ideas, we, we said uh, imperative, e imperative style is where you tell what and how. In the declarative style, uh, tell what and, uh, and not how, right? That's basically the difference. And we'll look at some code examples for this in, uh, shortly. Functional is declarative plus higher order functions. So that is the relationship between these three uh, paradigms. We are all used to imperative style. And it's natural for us to think in imperative style when it comes to writing code. But we need to start thinking a little bit more declaratively. And that's going to take a bit of an effort. And then we can move into functional style right after that 
to do better. So given this, let's talk about the functional style of programming. So before I talk about it, I got a little quiz for you, a little trivia, if you will. Does somebody know what year, and don't worry about being wrong, it's okay to be wrong. Um, what year do you think object-oriented programming became mainstream? Like it became mainstream, nobody complained about it, they quietly started using it. Maybe overuse it. 19 is good, what else? What was it? Okay, 1990, right? 1990. Does anyone know what year OO was created? I'll give you a clue. It was before 1990. 1960, you said? 19, I'm not talking about some nice movie that was released. Nineteen sixty-seven. This was Dahl and Nygaard, two Norwegians, who created O programming. Right? This came out of Norway, and these two guys created object-oriented programming. The term was coined by Alan Kay, an American scientist, but he didn't create object-oriented programming. The people who created this was Norwegians. Now look at this for a minute. If object-oriented programming was a human. It had a terrible childhood. Nobody cared about it until it was 23. And they said, hey, handsome, you want to hang out now? Right? That took 27, 23 years before the world recognized it. So sometimes good ideas take time. You've got to just invest and work on it, right? Now, does anyone know what year the basis, the, the concepts behind functional programming the lambda calculus, what year that was introduced? Nine, did you say 1930? Are you serious, 1930? You're right, 1929. Everyone here knows Alan Turing. This was Alan Turing's professor, Alonzo Church. He introduced this idea of lambda calculus. Now, last question for you. Can anybody tell me what year functional programming became mainstream? That was a trick question, not yet. A good 90 years later, we are just getting excited. And when somebody comes to me and says, in software field, everything changes very fast, I say, what are you smoking? <laughs> We are just getting excited about something that's been even before OOP came together, right? Our grandfathers are sitting there, either in armchair or in grave, doesn't matter where they are. And they're looking at us like, are you kids serious? We've been waiting for you all these years, right? FP was way ahead of time. In fact, one of the very first programming languages ever created, Lisp, was a functional programming language. I call this the politics of programming languages. Just because somebody is popular doesn't, even, doesn't mean they are good. I'm not referring to US government at this point. But just kind of mentioning it. I, have a, we, I am shameful of my precedent. But that's my problem. I have to deal with it. But that same thing in languages too. Programming languages, just because something is most widely used doesn't mean it's good or it's better. It's just that it's the politics of programming languages. So the point really is that this has been around for a very long time. So it's not a newfangled idea that came out yesterday and we're going to try. It's been around for quite a long time. But a lot of things have changed around to make this really effective, make this really interesting. Well, the very first thing is assignment-less programming. What does that mean? You're going to program with no assignments. And you will hear people say, that's crazy talk. How could you program with no assignments? That's a reasonable question to ask. Let's draw a parallel. Let's draw a parallel. Let's talk about something before that came before this, structured programming. In structured programming, what were we told? Go to was evil. Anyone, anyone remembers who told this? That's right, Edgar Dijkstra. 
Edgar Dijkstra said, go tos are evil, we shouldn't program with it. Because go to leads to spaghetti code, right? And spaghetti code, I don't know about you, spaghetti is nice to eat but not to code with. And spaghetti coding, convoluted logic, it's really hard to work with. Why is this such a bad idea? But remember what go to does. You're in a function. And go to says, go to here. Now, logically, right? You're here in this room. You're having a good time, right? Now, if this door opens, somebody walks in, that's OK. If one of you get up and go through the door, that's OK. But how would you feel if suddenly somebody just appeared next to you? You're going to freak out. That's what go to is. It says, I'm here. It's like, whoa, where did you come from? What's your context, right? And it just announces, bolts in. And that messes up the whole thing for us, right? So it's like, no, go, no more go tos. So go tos are evil, don't do it. OK, so you won't program with go to, right? Absolutely. Let's write some Java, just for the fun of it. So I'm going to say blah. I'm going to run the code. Watch very carefully what the error is. Error, blah is not a statement. Can you remember that? Blah is not a statement. Great. Now I'm going to say over here, uh, go to. Look at the error. Illegal start of expression. Huh? What does that mean? It means go to is legal, but I dare you to use it. So go to is a forbidden keyword in Java. It's actually a reserved word. They just don't want you to use it. In fact, it's a language that removed the word go to ever from code. So you would never put the word go to. You cannot even use it as a variable because it's that evil, right? And that's what Java did. OK, so you won't use go to's. So go to is evil, right? Said structured programming. We can all agree to that, right? So in structured programming, great. Let's do something else. For int i equal to 0. And then I'm going to say i less than 10. And then i plus plus. And here I'm going to say output i, but only if i is greater than 5. Very simple example. So I printed 5 through 9. But before we go further, let's try something else. Let's go over to the command prompt. And let's go over to where this code is sitting. And once I get there, let's take a look at the byte code. So Java P minus C, but minus C is already an alias on my machine, so I'm not putting it. So Java P minus C. And this is called sample.class. Well, that's located in the classes. So classes, sample.class. Look at the byte code. What does the bytecode have? If you examine the bytecode, surprise, there is go to. You say, wait, 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 didn't we just agree no go to's anymore? Well, you have matches at home, right? Everybody has matches at home. Do you go to the children and say, children, I'm going to go take a shower. Here are some matches for you to play with. I hope not, right? Well, you have matches at home, but it's for adults to use, not for children. Exactly the point. So they said, we got go to, but that's for we adults to use, not for you children, right? Well, because if you and I use go to, we will mess up. If they use go to, they mess up, which is fine with me, as long as I don't have to mess up and you don't have to mess up, right? Because if you and I mess up, we got to maintain the code. So the point is, just because there is no go to, it doesn't mean there is no go to. It simply means there is no go to in our code. Exactly the point about assignments. Just because we say there is no assignment, that doesn't mean there is no assignment. It simply means there is no assignment in our code. There will be assignments under the hood, just like there is go to under the hood. It's just that we will not use assignments. And that is basically what the idea is. So to relate this back, go to is to structure programming as assignment is to functional programming. So that's the whole idea. So go to is to structure programming as assignment is to functional programming. Just like you and I don't use go to in the code, but it may happen under the hood, 
you and I don't use assignment, but it may happen under the hood. That's the whole idea. So that's the very first thing to keep in mind. Well, it, does, it, does, it favors immutability. They don't want you to modify. They don't want you to mutate variables. Why shouldn't we mutate variables? If you mutate variables, concurrency is hard. Would you agree? When you have multiple threads, things mess up. If you don't mutate, you don't have to protect what doesn't change, isn't it? That's one benefit you get. Second thing, when you, when you promise immutability, a compiler can perform optimizations very nicely. What can a compiler do? The compiler says, look, I know this isn't mutable. I can take some things for granted. But if something were mutable, it says, oh my gosh, don't touch it with a nine-foot pole because something could go wrong. Well, let's see if that's true. Here's yet another example for you. Very trivial example, nevertheless. I'm going to say static int a equals to 4. Static int b equals to 5. And I'm going to say output a plus b. Result is 9. No doubt about it. Let's take a quick peek at this. Java p minus c again. Let's expand into the bytecode and take a look at what we have. And what does the bytecode say? Watch this carefully. Load up the value of 3. Load up the value of 4. Notice this, I add. I add is an instruction at the bytecode level that literally performs addition. So every time you run this code, what's going to happen? An add is going to happen. Make sense? And you're like, duh, is that what's supposed to happen? Why are we talking about it, right? I'm just proving to you what you thought should happen is happening. That's all, right? OK, let's try something a little different. Let's go back to the code, and I'm going to change this to final. What did you just say? You said A is immutable, and B is immutable. And what do we know about plus? It's a pure function. Plus doesn't change A, correct? Plus doesn't change B. Can you imagine the world when you call plus and changes everything around it? You're like, don't touch that plus, right? It's sticky. Well, plus doesn't change anything. You give an input, it gives you an output. It says, I don't touch anything, right? Let's try this again. Run the code. What's the result? Still a 9. But let's go take a look at the bytecode one more time. What just happened? Right here it says, push 9 and be done. There is no add. There is no add. What, what happened to the add? The compiler says, hey, I can figure this out at compile time. Because a plus b is always 9. Why? Because a is constant, b is a constant, immutable, and the compiler can optimize things. So when you have immutability, a compiler can optimize things very easily. And that's exactly what we just saw here, right? There's another point I want to make. When you, when you read concepts, don't read them. Try it out. Dig deeper and say, I want to see it. So what do you mean you want to see it? I want to see it, right? You, you talk to biologists, what they, they don't talk about theory. It's like, roll up a microscope. I want to see under the hood, right? And that's the whole point. Tear it up and see it. Prove to yourself this is actually true. And that's what we're seeing here is that it didn't really you know, use that. But the beauty of this is we can do quite a bit of optimization in that way. And of course, higher order functions. So what are higher order functions? Higher order functions are functions to which you can pass other functions. So let's talk about that for a minute. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say we, can, we may pass an object to a function. We may create an object within a function. And we may return an object from a function. Well, this is all we do all the time already. But what is a higher order function? A higher order function is where we may pass a function to a function. We may create a function within a function. We may return a function from a function. That's what makes it a higher order function. So higher order functions allow us to do function decomposition. We are used to doing object decomposition. Object decomposition is where 
you create classes, objects, and delegate responsibility to these objects, and then objects communicate with each other by calling messages, passing messages, invoking methods. We're saying, no, we don't have to just do that. We could do function decomposition. We can pass functions around. I can call you, you can send me a function I can execute. It's kind of like you go to the coffee shop, and you're gonna say, I would like a, like a cup of coffee, please. What do they say? Would you like a cappuccino or espresso? Like a cappuccino, please. What kind of temperature do you want? Do you want a kid's temperature or adult's temperature? Would you like to have sugar in it? So we are having a conversation. It's not like you went to the coffee shop and said, I'm going to give you a full spec and give you all the information. Don't talk to me. I'm going to give you this, and all you give me back is the result, right? We don't do that. We're conversational. What if we do this in the functions too? I'll call the function. You give me an input but you also give me a function which I can call again and get, you, get more data from me. Benefit, we can customize this conversation very nicely, right? You identify a core and then you can start customizing things around it. That becomes a very nice design option. So we use function composition and lazy evaluations. What does it mean function composition and lazy evaluation? Let's look at an example of this here. Suppose I want to perform this operation. I want to take a collection of people so we'll go to create people. I got a bunch of people I've created. But what I want to do here is I want to, let's say, find out the total of age of all the male in the group. Total of age of all the male. How do I do that? Well, I can say over here output. First of all, people, right? So create people gives me the people. And I can say dot filter given a person I can say person dot get gender is equal to gender dot male so this is all the male then I can say map given a person only get me the age of the person dot sum I can perform the total of the age of the people and this is going to be two int so this happens to be the way we can bring the person in the collection and then get the age of, total of the age of the person that is in the collection. Let's fix the error real quick, and then we'll move on. So line number 21, oh, of course, I, I got to get a stream out of it. So let's do that. So dot stream. So you can see in this case, we got the people collection, and that was 126 was the age of all the male in this collection. I mean, you could do the math and find out that it's true, but that's what the result is. But this is a function composition. So what we did is we said, given the collection of people, get me only the male in the list, but only get me the age of the males, then total it up. This is function composition. Why is this a function composition? This is like liquid flowing through a pipeline. You have this pipeline of operation. You take the data, transform it, transform it, transform it, and you're moving it down. So the data is being transformed through and you are applying series of transformations. Your thought process design is very different. In the old style, what did you do? In the imperative style, what did you do? Well, you said, I want to do this, I want to do this. You're moving these different parts. You're march giving marching instructions. Put your left forward, put the next left forward, right? You're telling what to do and how to do it every single step. Here you are saying, here's a collection, just get me the mail. Once you have the mail, only get me the people's age. Once you get the age, total it. You're giving instructions on what to do, but you're not in the business of iterating. The iteration automatically happens. It's an autopilot within the filter on the map to int. So you don't have to really spend the time and effort doing the work. You're just giving instructions to what to do. So that is the function composition. However, let's change the problem just a little bit. What if instead of adding everybody's age, what if I wanted to find the age of the first male in the collection? Well, now I'm going to say find first. Dot or else, let's say zero, if we don't find it. So what am I doing now? I'm saying given all the people, get me only the male, but only get me their age, but get me the age of the first person and nobody else. So if I run this, the age is 20. Is that true? Notice the age of the first male is 20. So that's what this is returning, 20. 
But you look at this and say, oh my gosh, this is crazy talk, right? Because if I'd written a for loop, what would happen? I go first, take the first person, which is Sarah, not a male. Second person also Sarah, not a male. Third person was Bob, male. Here's the age 20, break. But here, I go get the, all the people and get their gender. If I have a million people, I'd have done a million queries by now. Then, of course, I say, get me all your age. If in the million I had 250 male, I'd have gotten 250 queries for the age. And then you're saying, good, you did all that hard work. I want the first one, throw it away. Right? What a waste, isn't it? Well, the good news is that's not the way it works. It is lazy evaluation. It says, no, 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 no. I'm going to take the first. So it's not taking a collection and working on the collection and the collection and the collection. Instead, it takes the very first element, Sarah. Is Sarah a male? No. Move on to the next to Sarah now. Not a male. Move on to Bob. Hey, Bob is a male. Get the age of Bob. Find first. Here you go. Oh, thanks. You're done. Find first breaks the loop already. This is where what you see is not what you get. This is the beauty of this. You shouldn't be looking at the syntax of the code. You should be looking at the semantics of the code. Syntax is visible. Semantics is hidden. This is why it's not what you look at. It is what you see. And you got to see the semantics. You look at the syntax, but you see the semantics. When you write code, don't look at the syntax. See the semantics. Because semantics is what bothers us the most. Semantics is where the differences are. And that is the semantic. If you don't know the semantic of this code, you'll go home screaming. This is, you know, I came from this conference. This bunch of people are crazy people. They are a cult. They talk about this function programming, it's going to suck in performance, right? But the minute you realize the semantics, you're like, whoa, I'm part of that cult now, right? Because you have seen what it actually does. And it doesn't do what it appears to do in your human eye. And this was my aha moment, right? When I was looking at this stuff, I'm like, yeah, OK, no big deal. And then it hit me, oh my gosh. This is different than what I thought it is. It's lazy evaluation. So what does that mean? Yet another thing I want to you know, refer to. Polymorphism, so polymorphism is to object to programming as lazy evaluation is to functional programming. Earlier I said, go to is to Structured programming as uh, assignment is assignment, right? Is to functional programming. Now I'm saying polymorphism is to oh, programming as lazy evaluation is to functional programming. This is the realization of these paradigms. Why are you using OOP? Because I can benefit from polymorphism, right? That is the real power, right? It's it's kind of like saying, hey, why are you married? Because they give me a tax discount when I'm married. That would be a wrong reason to get married. Right? It's like getting married because you save on taxes. That, that's a really, really poor way to get married, right? There are so many other fun things to be married. There's a reason to be married. And you've got to find the details for it. In a similar way, why are you doing OOP? Yeah, not because it gives you encapsulation. Sure, it's fun to have encapsulation. But what's the pathway it leads to? Polymorphism. Likewise, why are you doing functional programming? Not because it has immutability. It's because immutability gives way to laziness. It's the laziness that we are really after. Because being lazy means efficiency. You're not eagerly doing stuff. You can postpone it to a later time. And by postponing a later time, you can save on performance, and you can achieve those results. Happy with this so far? So this gives us an idea of what this FP really means in this context. Let's talk about some design concerns. The very first thing I want to emphasize is purity of functions. What is a pure function? 
a pure function is one that has no side effects. That's what a pure function is. A pure function has no side effects. What is a side effect? Side effect is some kind of a state change. And pure functions don't have any side effects. You already used a pure function today. Plus. What does plus change? It changes nothing, isn't it? You give inputs, and it gives you an output. Well, there's a benefit of a pure function. There's a property of a pure function. A pure function gives the same result any number of times, as long as the input is the same. Pure functions are idempotent. You can call them any number of times. They give you the same output. What is 7 plus 7? 14. What is 7 plus 7? 14. You can keep asking this. And what does the person say? 14 every single time. They're not going to make, change it just because you're calling it seventh time. It's always the same, isn't it? So pure functions give you exactly the same result every time you call it. I'm going to say A++. Is this pure or impure? It is impure. You call it once, it gives you one result. Call it again, it gives you a different result. Why? Because it changed A. How much time is there for this talk to be over? Is it a pure function or impure function? Because I asked the question again a few minutes ago, what are you going to say? It feels like eternity, right? No, I mean, whatever time is left. But the point is that you have the time, but the time is not fixed. The time is changing all the time. Hmm, what a concept. Well, the time is changing constantly. And as a result, when you make a call, your results will be different, right? So. When you have a pure function, it's going to be the result all the time. What's the benefit of a pure function? When you have a pure function, you can take the result of a pure function and you can save it. And then you can return it next time it's called. Which means I can have an expensive computation. I do it once, and the next time you call, I'll give you the result right away because I saved it. I don't have to recompute it. That's one benefit. But there is two rules of purity. So two rules of purity. One, a pure function does not change anything. Is that easy to, easy to think about? Is that easy? Right? Is, is, you're like, obvious, right? Would you agree? Pure function doesn't change anything. Because if you're changing something, it's not pure. That's very clear, right? But the second rule is what catches people off guard. A pure, a, a, a pure function does not depend on anything that may change. Second rule is extremely important. A pure function doesn't change anything. A pure function does not depend on anything that may potentially change. I'll give a slogan that's easy to remember. See no evil? Do no evil, right? So see no evil, do no evil. Point one is do no evil. Don't change anything. But don't also depend on anything that changes. Now you may wonder, my gosh, I can, remember, I can understand the second, first rule. If you change something that's bad, don't do it. But isn't it too restrictive that I should never depend on anything that changes? Well, the reason you cannot depend on something that changes is if something changes that I depend on, I cannot be lazy. Remember what laziness means. You don't have to run now. You can run later. But wait a minute. If I run now, I get this value. If I run later, hey, you still get the same value. Oh, I can wait then. But if the value will change by the time you run it, you're going to say, run now, quick, fast. Run it now, eagerly, before the value changes. You can never be lazy if your function is not pure. Well, here's the sad part. When you work in languages like Haskell, Erlang, the language guarantees that the function is pure. Language like JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, they don't guarantee purity. You and I have to ensure that it's pure. We have to take the effort to do that. But if you don't, 
the results may be very unpredictable. So we need to guarantee purity of functions. That brings up the question, is this even practical? Does this even make sense? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Is it even practical? Well, I'm going to say don't change anything. If I say don't change anything, well, then how do you write a program where anything useful gets done? I can show you a program which doesn't change anything. I can show you a perfectly pure program. Would you like to see it? I'll show you a very perfectly pure program where nothing ever changes. Right? Absolutely pure, right? It's, it's absolutely pure. What does it do? Nothing. But any practical program has to change state, right? It's got to change something or the other. If it never changes anything, what good is the program? You can go to the boss and say, I wrote a perfect program. It is the most pure program. What does it do? Nothing. You don't even have to run it, right? Well, but we have to make change. We have to effect change. So there seems to be a conflict here. How could you write code where everything is pure and yet you will get the result out? That's a bit confusing, right? So how do we deal with it? My recommendation is to think about it a little differently. On one end of the spectrum, you have languages like Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python, Perl, Ruby, Scala, keep putting all these languages. What do all these languages do? They allow mutability. Go to the other extreme. These are languages like Haskell, where you cannot change anything. Where do you live? Here or here? Oh, you live in my neighborhood too. That's where I live too. You know what this is? That one is the cathedral. This is the bazaar. Cathedrals are beautiful, but nobody wants to live in a cathedral. It's fun to be living in the bazaar, isn't it? So that's why we are here. And then we look over here and say, so, hey, Haskell guys, yeah? So you write a program, huh? And nothing changes. Yep, everything is pure. What do you guys smoke? How could you practically write a program when nothing changes, right? It feels like it's Narnia, but we can never get there. We never found the wardrobe to enter to go to Narnia. And our day in the bazaar is messy, and we kind of wonder, there's a disconnect here. All these functional guys are talking about purity and the wonderful life they live in, where everybody is young and beautiful all the time, and yet here we are in the, in the, in the bazaar every day. What's going on here? There seems to be something, a complete disconnect. Maybe this is not for us. Maybe we can use this. Well, let's think about it in practical terms. We are going to change the database. We're going to change the objects. We're going to effect change. But functional programming says, no mutability, please. Everything is immutable. So what do we do? I want you to think about it in a slightly different way. I want you to think about it as, a circle of purity and a ring of impurity. Just entertain the thought for a minute. Draw a circle. That circle is pure. You enter the circle, you don't change any state. Clean hands, good noble thoughts, just keep going. Don't change any state with the circle, a ring of impurity. That impurity circle is like Las Vegas. Anything can happen there. <laughs> but the minute you leave that circle and enter, you are the noblest person on earth. <laughs> right? So that circle with the ring of impurity around it, do whatever you want to do here, but you entered the circle, now everything is pure until you cross over and enter the ring, impurity. In other words, make your function pipeline pure. Do all the mutability you want to your heart's content before you enter the pipeline. 
then everything is pure. And then when you get out of the pipeline, make a change. Here is another way to think about it. Who here has ever entered a train? Come on, you all have, yes. Who here has exited a train? You better raise your hand, otherwise you won't be here. Yes, you did. Who has entered or exited a train when the train is in motion? <laughs> Superman? <laughs> Sorry? When it's in motion, it's when it's driving at 60 by 70 miles an hour. When it's in motion, that's what motion is, not when it's cranking up. <laughs> when it's in full motion. He is like, no, okay, thank you. I was like going to come and hug you and say, this is, this is amazing, Superman is here. No, we don't, right? Just think about it that way. Think of your pipeline as a fast-moving train. Yes, you can enter before it starts. Yes, you can exit when it stops. You can do the, think of mutation as entry and exit. But while it's in motion, don't mess with it. So think of your application as a series of pipelines that you draw. Does that give you a practical approach now? You don't have to be in Narnia. You don't have to be in the bazaar. You could be right here in the middle. Because you can take all your mutations you want, enter your pipeline, go through the series of transformations. When you get out, capture the result and go update. As an example, let's try this. See if this makes sense. Given the people collection, right, that we have with us, the problem says this. Change the age, sorry, increment the age of the first male older than 30. What are the two steps you need to perform in this operation? Right? Find the person who is male and older than 30, is that right? What's the second operation? Change their age. Which of those two has mutability? Change the age. Which of them falls nicely into functional style? Find the person. You see, now there is clarity here, right? Separate this into two phases. The pipeline to get the person and the mutability to do after you get out of the pipeline. Don't try to change the object while you're on the pipeline. Why? Because if you change the object while in the pipeline, you can never parallelize it. Where it makes sense to that is. If you're changing things while in the motion, you disrupt the entire data. Things can derail very much. This is like trying to exit a train when it's running. Depends on where you're trying to exit. The train may, may derail as well, or you may derail for sure. But you don't want to do that. So what can I do? I can do this. I can say over here something like person, uh, first male older than 30, right? Is equal to what? Create people dot stream dot filter given a person, person dot get gender where gender is equal to male. With me so far? Dot filter. Person, person dot get age is greater than 30, correct? Dot find first. With me so far? Is it possible the list has no males? Is it possible the list has nobody over 20 or 30? So it's possible that this may not exist. So that becomes optional person because it may not exist. Then you say, all right, if first male older than 30 is present, then I can say first person older than 30 dot get dot set age or even increment age if there's such a function, or set age to age plus one. Do you see the pipeline in front of you? Is the pipeline pure, right? 
That's a circle of purity. Line number, I don't know what the line number is. Let's see. Line number 22 to 26 is your pipeline, is your circle of purity. Line number 29 and uh, 30 is your ring of impurity. You got out of the pipeline. When you do a for each in a stream, for each receives a consumer. Consumers have side effect. That's where you had exited the train, you've gotten to the station. Make sense? That's your ring of impurity. So think about this as a circle of purity and a ring of impurity. When you program, it's not purity versus impurity. It is where you mix them together in the most sensible fashion. So you design your application where you have several of these pipelines and you protect the data from mutability in the pipeline, enter the pipeline, you can mutate before, exit the, pipe, exit the pipeline, you can mutate after. Any questions before we go? Yes, sir. Oh, you can do a for each, but that would be an imperative style, not a functional style. Yeah, the goal here is to... Oh, uh, pardon me, pardon me, I understand now what you're saying. To use the for each in functional style. Yes, the reason why you cannot use a for each is it'll be modifying all the people's age. One way... So, so let's, let's, we'll come to that in a minute. So if you want to really still do it in this case, you would put a limit one and then for each. So you can still do it, right, if you want to do it that way. But my recommendation is not to do it. And the reason is you really want to strive for clarity as much as you can. Because things begin, in, a, in language which is purely functional, the language protects you. In a language which is hybrid function, uh, functional, you and I have to protect it. It's easy to get confused, easy to miss I, I like clarity of code, because when things are kept separate, it's less risky. When you combine it, you've got to stare at it every single time. That's the reason I would say it's better to separate it out. What you could have done is you could have said for each, and then you could have taken the person, you could have done an increment right there, and yes, that will work, but the problem with that is that works really well maybe for one value, but if you have multiple values, then you still may have to worry about concurrency depending on what they affect. But once you get out of the pipeline, you know that you are not in this lazy valuation. You're not also in this parallel execution, if, it's all, if at all possible. It gives you that safetyness in your mind saying, I am no longer in the pipeline, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, on the other hand, if you do it, you'll have to examine it and say, is this OK? Am I at fault here? And generally, I don't like to spend my time on that, right? Clarity, it's kind of like they, they talk about, um, you know, conflict, conflict of interest. When you are a, uh, you know, owner of this, you shouldn't be doing this. There's a reason they have those rules in the society for ethics and law, right? Because then we don't have to keep examining every few times. It's very clear separation of concern. It's, so it's for clarity purpose. So it's not that you shouldn't, you cannot do it. I would say maybe you shouldn't do it, right? That, that's the reason for clarity. That, that's the purpose. Yes, please. Right, so the question is, what's the benefit of separating it? The uh, separation is, we already agreed, a function pipeline should not do mutability. So you, you cannot mix them together. So you have to separate. And uh, are we doing it twice? Not in this case, particularly. The reason you're not doing it twice in this case is, it's only one, one element. Yeah, if you had multiple objects, yes, you are uh, uh, iterating through it more than once, but uh, what is the consequence of that? Maybe there's none. Yeah. Yeah, but, but again, always ask the consequence. What's, what are we losing? Maybe nothing. Maybe it's a wash. Maybe it doesn't affect us. Or maybe it does. 
If it affects you and if it's really, really that much of an effect, I got a better answer. Go back and program in imperative style. Right? Or, oh, no, 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 I don't want to program in imperative style. I really want to do this here, but I want better performance. Maybe you can use parallel if it makes sense. Right? If the performance impacts you, you got two choices. See if you can improve the performance by using parallel if it makes sense. Or you can fall back on imperative again. You're not required to. So all we are saying is play by the rules. You don't have to come into this party. But if you come to this party, you got to wear a costume. Right? So you're setting the rules. That's all you're saying. Please. You, in here, you're not. Because you're getting back one element from the list. And uh, functional pipeline stream do not modify inputs. They give you a new list. If at all, they give a list. We are not getting a list in this case. But had you gotten a list, you would have gotten a new list. Not the, you won't change the original list. Original is completely preserved until 4, 30, 29. It's in 29 that you're trying to go back and change the original. That's the circle of the ring of impurity that I talked about. So moving a little forward, you want to think functionally as you work with it. So when you think functionally, you want to start formulating your problem into the series of these transformations. So if I give you a problem, you have to ask yourselves, how do I formulate this problem in a way that I can do these transformations rather than looping and if and else and break? And, and that's the thing we have to take the time to learn. How do you formulate the problem in a functional pipeline? And honestly, that's going to take some time. And don't feel frustrated. Don't feel like you've got to get it on the first day or the second day or the third day or even in the fourth month. It's OK to take the time. You don't have to get it right away. And in all honesty, I did not get it the right the uh, first time either. It is something you just learn, and it clicks eventually, and you're thinking more and more. I'll tell you I'm at about 50% level right now. If you give me a problem, I can write it in functional style 50% of the time. The other 50% of the time, I got to struggle. I got to think about it. It's not natural to me. Why? Because I grew up programming in imperative style. That's what is my first language, to so to say, right? That's what comes to my mind immediately. This style of programming is better, but I have to learn it. It is, it is secondary. It has not become second nature yet. And, and that's OK. It's not, we're not in a competition. We're not trying to prove to the world that we are smart or we are not. It's all about improving what we do. And that's perfectly OK to take the time to learn that. There's nothing wrong with it. So, so start thinking functionally as the series of transformations that you can do. And finally, how do we do, deal with exceptions? What do you do in, in imperative style with exceptions? Can we think about it? I am calling a function. That function calls a function. That calls a function. And I, ouch, I hit my toe. What, what, what do I do now? Run back. Mom, I hit my toenails. Hell, right? So what do you do? You keep going, and the minute you hit an exception, you fly back, disrupting your call stack. Put that thought away for a minute. What does functional programming pipeline mean? Downstream, downstream. This is downstream, right? You're getting this downstream. You're climbing down. I'm downstream. And I land into a trouble here. I'm going to climb back up here. Does it make sense? Oh, let me give you a different example. Imagine you're driving on a freeway, and you're going at 70 miles an hour. Sorry, I, I'm still in miles in uh, Fahrenheit. So you're driving at 70 miles an hour, and you're on the freeway, and suddenly you have a flat tire. Psst. What's the most illogical thing to do? Oh my gosh, I got a flat tire. Reverse. Would you do that? It makes no sense, isn't it? What's the most logical thing to do? Do you have a flat tire? Exit the next exit. Keep going downstream. You don't reverse back on a freeway. That's exactly the point to think about. When you are in a stream-based programming, you deal with it. It's a good data. Keep going. It's an error. Keep going. There is nothing to turn back. You are downstream. 
So in true functional programming, you don't go upstream ever. You just keep moving forward. Your error, move on. Data, move on. Keep going, handle it in the next st stage. Changes the way we think, isn't it? We cannot be programming when the same way when you shift a paradigm. We have to rethink. So it's not just a question of using some hodgepodge of functions saying, let's go home. You got to rethink about the way you develop the system. So exception, there's no exception. There is data and there is error. And error is also what? Data. There is good smelling data. There is not so good smelling data, which is the error. But you keep moving it forward, right? So in other words, you got to rethink about how you program. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's something you have to try. So how does Java 8 deal with this? Unfortunately, not in a good way. Not in a good way. Don't get me wrong, I love Java 8. I love streams. But remember our job as engineers and professionals, we got to be objective. It's, oh, all this is beautiful, all this sucks. No, there's pros and cons. Here's what is good about streams. Here is what is not good about streams. What's good about streams? Thank you. It's lazy. Absolutely hit it on the nail on the head. That's the beauty of streams. It's lazy. That's good about streams. It's got beautiful functions which do specialized operations, right? And streams are available on different collections to go. All these are good news. One thing really not so good is it doesn't handle exceptions properly. If a function were to throw an exception, which is a checked exception, your code won't even compile. Let's take a look. So if I go back here in this example, let's create a different example here. So if I were to take an example of, let's say, uh, some numbers, and in this, let's say I'm going to take an example of a list of numbers, 1 to 10, and I'm going to say numbers.stream dot map sample colon colon process and then dot for each and I'm going to system dot out dot print learn and I'm going to print it. Well the question obviously what does process do? So public static and uh, static int process int number and I'm going to simply return a number times two. So run this code it gives twice of that. But imagine this process is doing something goofy, but it runs into an error. It says if number is equal to five, throw. Tell me a scary exception to throw. That'll freak you out. What is it? Uh, null pointer. Out of, out of memory, I want something scary. Uh, what? What? Is that a really exception you can actually throw from here? <laughs> can you help me lift him up and will eject him from here? How about something like a Korba exception or something like that, right? Okay. So let's say our argument. Is it argument exception? Why, why do you know this? Okay. Illegal argument exception, right? Is that correct? Uh, throw new illegal argument exception. No, that's not right. Did I make a mistake? A R G U M E. I wanted to have a very strong argument. So what happened? Well, it turns out it's a runtime exception. I want a checked exception. Does anybody know what checked exception I could use? Exception itself, let's try that. What happens now? Compilation error. Unreported exception, exception. Must be caught. Line number 16, right? So what am I going to do? Throws exception. This is the standard beautiful practice in Java, right? Just bubble it up. Now where do you get the error? 
Line number 10, what's the problem? Map says, nope, sorry, can't take it. Right? Cannot accept it. So what am I going to do now? I cannot pass here. So I'm going to do something absolutely stupid, isn't it? New runtime exception. And wrap that into this exception and throw it. The compiler won't complain, but the code is going to still fail at some point, isn't it? Well, why? Because you got a runtime exception. But notice, it doesn't handle too well. Why? Because you disrupted the call chain, and it did what the imperative code will do. What? Run up and tell the caller, right? It's not going downstream. Well, one way you can handle this is suppress the exception and then send a data. But then you have to capture the data in a way it would be a good data or an exception. And Java class structure is not very malleable for that. Whereas in purely functional programming languages, they give you stuff called maybe monads. Well, Java doesn't have those concepts. It's a little sticky. But you've got to work through it, right? Maybe you create your own object where you may have, you may have inheritance hierarchy. Base class is healthy, derived as an exception. How about that? And then when you pass it along, you can polymorphically decide what to do based on good part or the bad part. You got to work a little hard to do that. The language doesn't help you directly with it. The, the onus is on you to do it. Well, there's actually a better way, a different way you could do this. And I would ask you to consider. How many of you program in Java? Let me re oh, sorry, let me ask you differently. How many of you don't program in Java? OK, so you guys don't have to worry about it. You guys don't have to worry about it, right? They are like, Shh, we don't have to worry about this. But the, those of us who program in Java, we got to worry about this. But for everybody else, everybody around, including those who program in Java, we can consider some alternatives. And that is, what about JavaScript promises? There's one thing I really like in JavaScript promises. JavaScript promise has the same pipeline that we're going to see here. It's OK if I take a few more minutes. Thank you. So we, we, can, um, we can go a little further with uh, promises. Let's take a look at an example of a promise just to entertain the thought. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to say, in this case, some function, let's go ahead and write function foo. Let's call it compute. What does compute do? Compute takes a number. But it says, I'm going to return a new promise function res uh, resolve, comma, reject. And, and that is my promise I'm going to return. We'll come back to the code in just a minute. What am I going to do, use, to, do to use this? I'm going to say call compute. And the call compute is a function I'm creating. The call compute says, I'm going to take a number given, and I'm going to say compute number dot then result, and I'm going to output, uh, output re, uh, result is. So result is plus result, right? But then dot catch, isn't that beautiful? Error, and what am I going to print with the error? I'm going to say over here, very intelligent response, right? Oops, and then print the error. Now look at what just happened. I'm going to call compute and pass a five. Well, in here, I'm going to say, if number given to me is greater than 3, resolve, let's say, number times 2. Let's start with that for a minute. Result is 10, as you would expect, right? That worked. Result is 10. But what if something is going to break? What if something is going to go wrong? What am I going to do? Well, I can say, else, reject. That's an error state. Please, not that number. So what's going to happen? I'm going to reject it. So call compute this time again. And this call compute says, I'm going to pass a minus 2 to it. What's it going to do now? Oops, please, not that number. That was on minus 2. So it knows to go through then, if everything was fine, and through catch if everything was not fine. So what did we just do? We put the pipeline, but we gave two tracks. This is the good track. This is the bad track. Just like our hands. 
You know what you do with this one, you know what to do with this one. Just keep them separate. But it's downstream. You're going to say, here's the data, keep moving. Oops, something went wrong. Here's the error, keep moving. Keep moving forward. And the beauty of this is, you can continue further. I can take this number. I'm not going to print it. Dot then result, result times 2. If I gave you a number, you already multiplied it. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 times 2 is 20. Run the code, it's 20 as you can see. So it goes from this then down to the then. Keep flowing forward in the positive way. Something went wrong, go to the catch. That is one approach to deal with. So if you're programming in JavaScript, raise of hands. There you go, you already have a solution in JavaScript, right? Promises deal with this really nicely. Promises have been designed with that in mind. You know what? We are a pipeline. Things will go wrong. We'll give you two paths, the good path and the awful path. Make sense? Back to Java or RxJava, any, any language that you're working with, observables do this too. Let's take a quick look at an example, how this works. Rx. So const rx is equal to require rxjs, just as an example. rx.observable.create emitter. By the way, I'm writing this in JavaScript, but this works the same in Java as well. Not very different. So emit to the emitter. Well, what am I going to emit? We'll come to that in a minute. So here I'm going to say emitter, sorry, emit is a function. So function emit, what does emit want to do? Well, the function emit says, emit this value, let's say uh, emitter, emitter, and it says emitter dot uh, uh, next. In the case of Java, RxJava, you'd have called on next. Let's say four. Down here, dot subscribe. I can say dot map, given an element, element times two. I'm doubling the value. As you can see, the function pipeline again, isn't it? Observables have function pipeline too. But what am I going to do here? Data, output the data, please. You're happy with that so far? Run the code, it's eight. Why is it eight? It emits four. Four times two is eight. We printed eight. Happy? But what if this is going to next emit error? Uh-oh. Throw, sing, blah, blah, blah. You made him angry. What happened? He says, look, there was an exception. There was an error. You need to deal with it. Oh, OK. This is the data channel. This is the error channel. I can output error. Same idea as promises, isn't it? You can do this in Java also. You can do this anywhere reactive extensions are used. In reactive programming, observables have three channels. Data channel, error channel, complete channel. It's been built with that. The model of the story, in functional programming, when there is an error, what do you do? Keep on going. I hope now we can keep on going. Hope that was useful. Thank you.